Given what we know of Scotland's image in popular culture, you might imagine Scotland as a nation of Highlanders, and Wallace and his army as Highland warriors. They weren't, though it is true that Gaelic was spoken a lot more widely during the Middle Ages than it would be later. There were Highland soldiers in the Scottish army, but they were outnumbered by Lowlanders, who even in the 14th century would have dressed and sounded a lot more like their English opponents than their Highland allies. In fact, Highlanders were usually referred to as Irish, and Scottish Gaelic was usually referred to as Irish as well. There's a lot to unpack on this point. Calling Highlanders Irish was an insult, and even in the Middle Ages, the Irish were looked down upon by the English as barbarous. But it wasn't just an insult. There were quite a lot of links between the Highlands and Ireland during the Middle Ages and after. The same clans often ruled in both places. The Scottish MacDonalds and the Irish O'Donnells are both from the same clan, Clan Donald, whose chiefs ruled as Lords of the Isles for about 500 years. Similarly, McGuinness and MacGuinness are from Clan Innes, and O'Neill and MacNeil are from Clan Neil. When you go to Edinburgh or anywhere else in the Lowlands now, you'll see features of Highland culture everywhere. Kilts, bagpipes, tartans, etc. You see them largely thanks to 19th century romantics who idolized Highlanders as noble savages and saw the Highlands as embodying a part of Scotland that was lost in modernity. Before the 19th century, however, Highlanders were the archetypal other, even to other Scots. They spoke a strange language, wore strange clothing, and they periodically raided the lowlands to steal cattle. They were organized into clans, where each clansman took his chief's last name, names like MacLeod, etc., and each clan fought other clans and raided them for cattle. Their economy was actually based on it. Stolen cattle were an important tribute item for your lord. Lowland Scots feared Highlanders, but they also had total contempt for them. Here's the Scottish King James VI take on Highlanders, in a letter of kingly advice to his son at the end of the 16th century. As for the Highlands, I shortly comprehend them all into two sorts of people. The one that dwelleth in our mainland, that are barbarous and yet mixed with some sort of civility. The other that dwelleth in the isles and are all utterly barbarous, think no more of a goat than wolves and wild boars. Quite a statement from a king describing his subjects. For most of the Middle Ages, the Scottish government didn't have the resources to put down the Highlands. Their policy worked much like English claims to overlordship over Scotland. Clan chiefs would swear allegiance to the King of Scotland, but then they returned home and had almost absolute authority over their lands. They possessed what was called heritable jurisdiction, meaning they possessed the right of life and death over every person on their territory. They served as judge and jury over their tenants, who could not legally appeal to the monarch against their chief. Chiefs had other traditional obligations. If times were tough, the chief was supposed to provide food and help their clansmen. He would also distribute any loot or tribute among them. In return, clansmen of military age had to answer the chief if he summoned them to war, which was usually against other clans. It was a world apart from the lowlands of Scotland, not to mention England, and as long as lords in the lowlands could fend off Highland raiders, the Scottish government generally let them be. But the Reformation would help change all that. We've already seen how the Reformation led England to declare itself an empire, but it provided an impetus for both a closer union between England and lowland Scotland uniting them both against Catholic forces from within and without. Queen Elizabeth I of England, who comes to power in 1558, backed Protestant rebels in Scotland when they rebelled against their Catholic regent, Mary of Guise, and her daughter, the more famous Mary, Queen of Scots. The Protestants won, and their shared Protestantism and gratitude for this alliance brings lowland Scotland and England closer together. In fact, it brings them so close that Scottish Protestants actually went and smashed the tomb of Robert the Bruce in Dunfermline 
And they did such a good job of it that historians didn't know until the 19th century exactly where he was buried. Mary's son, James VI of Scotland, succeeded to the English throne as James I in 1603. Elizabeth died without an heir, and James was the next claimant through his great-grandmother. While the two kingdoms technically remained separate entities under the same king, bringing everything back to this point, you can imagine which kingdom is going to dominate the other under a regnal union. James, for his part, was thrilled to become King of England. In fact, he said that as King of England, every day is like a Christmas time. James, of course, was Protestant, and he constantly worried about Catholic threats to the realm, a problem that substantially diverted his attention to the highlands and islands of Scotland. The clans in these areas generally did not become Protestant. There are a number of reasons for why they didn't. For one thing, a society that valued the weight of tradition and customary obligations to the extent that the highlands did probably was not going to abandon the past so readily. The Highlands were also pretty unconnected from the book trade that spread Protestantism so widely over the rest of Europe. Gaelic wasn't much of a written language, and Protestant books weren't translated into Gaelic like they were into English, French, or German. In fact, the Bible was translated into English by 1536, but not into Gaelic until 1784. The fact that the Highlands and Islands remained Catholic was a big problem for the Scottish and later the British state. It provided a backdoor for the Spanish and French if they ever attempted to re-Catholicize England or Lowland Scotland. Spanish and French agents did repeatedly make contact with Highland clans to get them to rise in rebellion for the faith. In actual practice, the clans were not that interested. There were plenty of times when Catholic agents contacted a clan, offered money for a rebellion, and then returned to find out that no rebellion had happened and the money was missing. But this was not the last time that fear of a potential national security problem governed British policy decisions and attempts to dominate the peripheral parts of the British Isles. British authorities felt that they needed to spread Protestantism to the Highlands, and this went hand in hand with an attempt to civilize the region. If they did this, then Spain wouldn't have a backdoor into England and Lowland Scotland, and the king, in this case James VI of Scotland and the I of England, would control all of his territory. The state could develop the region economically, which would lead to more taxes and revenue for the crown. The only thing standing in the way was the people there. To accomplish this, James VI thought that he would plant civilized lowlanders, as he saw them, in parts of the highlands, where they would lead by example. They would remove the existing people, by force if necessary, and in no time the highlands and islands would become a prosperous place. As you can probably tell, James hadn't really thought this out very well. He zeroed in on the Isle of Lewis, which is off the northwestern coast of Scotland. The chief of the MacLeods, the clan that governed the region, was slow in declaring fealty, which provided the necessary excuse for the king to declare his lands forfeit. He offered MacLeod lands to a group of lowland investors called the Fife Adventurers, to whom he granted exclusive title to the island. They were to plant Lewis with Protestant lowland settlers, and he authorized them to expel or murder any inhabitants who would not forfeit their lands. This did not initially go so well. The Fife Adventurers led a couple hundred settlers to Lewis in 1602, where they founded a small town called Stormaway. The MacLeods, better armed than the life adventurers were, promptly raided the settlement and burned it, and then when the inhabitants tried to flee by boat, pirates hired by the MacLeods intercepted them and sank all of their vessels. So this attempt at colonization clearly didn't work, but the lesson that the government drew from it was that plantation is not possible unless the planters arrived with a substantial force. And that's where the Statutes of Iona come in. First, they were drawn up in 1609 after the failure of the Fife Adventures. James thought that he would be better off if he worked with the existing elites in the Highlands rather than simply throw them off their lands. They could potentially bring the muscle that the Scottish army could not. 
If he could attract them to what he believed was a civilized lifestyle, they could live as lowland aristocrats and landowners rather than clan chiefs, then these men would largely do the work for him. And in fact, the reading for this week is James's Statutes of Iona, which I've uploaded to the files section and questions about it to the discussion section. As you might have guessed, the statutes work in some ways and not in others. Highland chiefs seemed to treat this the same way that previous Scottish monarchs agreed to the English king's authority. Tell the king one thing and then get home and pretend like your meeting never happened. They do, however, start following the provisions that are in their own interests, especially the part about sending their sons to lowland schools. Chiefs do this not because they're being forced to dilute their culture, though for the government that's a bonus if it happens. They do it because they realize that they need to navigate the world of lowland and British politics, and it's the only way that they can build relationships with lowland and English politicians. Some clans send their elites to the same universities time and again, the Frasers to the University of Aberdeen, the Macdonalds to St. Andrews, you see this in many other places as the empire expands, it was in everybody's immediate interest. The British government wanted an elite class in the colonies well-versed in the culture of the metropole, and it would offer scholarships and all sorts of incentives to edu educate the next generation of elites. This extended all the way down to primary school. Here is just a sampling of colonial elites educated in Britain over the several centuries of the British Empire. Some of these individuals you're likely to recognize. These educational practices would eventually bother anti-colonial nationalists who felt that they were losing their culture when the elite received its education somewhere else. You'll see this theme especially shine when we get to Hein Swaraj and the path to freedom when we discuss anti-colonial nationalism. Despite the statutes of Iona, however, Highland culture in this example did not disappear overnight. None of the broader aims of the statutes were enforced, though they served as a template for later attempts to civilize the region. The Highlands would not fundamentally change for another century. 